Greetings and welcome to another podcast episode of Spark Hub. My name is Alan, and in this episode, I have the privilege of speaking with Maxine Clark about a range of topics, but mainly focused on the power of words and the power of great storytelling, and specifically through storytelling, creating what Maxine calls windows and mirrors. You'll hear the fuller story, but Maxine started by focusing on identity, about finding a mirror in a hero or a protagonist if no one else looks like you. And beyond that, a window to confidence, to curiosity, to pursuing knowledge and, and beyond what might immediately be around you. That was sort of the starting point. And Maxine's work has now been focused heavily on children recently. And the focus and consistency that Maxine has put into her work is paying dividends. As you'll hear, her work is making its way onto school syllabuses in Australia, into plays. And she has ambition to take her most popular works that seem to generate uh, joy wherever they go and take that work to where it, frankly, is really needed, which is now online in video form and beyond. Because let's face it, we really need great content in a world that can sometimes be overly negative or harmful. We also talk about how COVID affected both of us in, in, in terms of myself, what happened to me in the UK uh, and my family, and in her case, in Australia, which had some of the heaviest restrictions during COVID. As always, you can dive into more if you like this episode in the show notes below. And now, here is the conversation with Maxine Clark. Hey, Maxine, welcome to uh, the Spark Cup podcast. Really appreciate your time and and the connection to one of my previous guests. You're you're the sister of uh, Sarita Clark, who I interviewed about her daughter, Ayanna. So I'm quite keen to, t- to, to dive in and talk to you. But as tradition, I'd love if we could open with a quote that you've brought for the episode, and then we'll just dive in. Great. Thanks for having me on Spark Hub. Uh, the quote that I've brought is a Nina Simone quote, and it's an artist's duty, as far as I'm concerned, is to reflect the times. That's a great quote. Um, so on that topic, then, um, I'd love just to, you know, tell me where you've come from, what you're up to, what journey you've been on, what you, what is your profession day to day? And then uh, I've got some other questions to follow, but let's start with your, your journey to what you do and how you do it. Yeah, so I'm a writer. Uh, that for me includes poetry, memoir, short fiction, and in the last seven years or so, also children's picture books and writing for children. Um, so I think of myself, I suppose, as a storyteller. I My journey in writing initially started through slam poetry, actually. You know, I studied writing at university, finished university and fell into the world of Australian slam poetry. I'm based in Australia, although I have an Africa, Afro-Caribbean and Black British background. Um, And so, yeah, it kind of progressed from there. I eventually published a poetry collection and then moved on to short fiction. But I've become increasingly interested really in creating work for younger people in the last seven or eight years or so. Interesting. And sorry if this is a dumb question, but what is SLAM? Is it S-L-A-M? Is that an acronym? Yeah, so SLAM poetry um, kind of originated in the 1980s in New York. Um, Basically, the concept was... Poetry's become staid, boring, nobody wants to do it. Let's make it a little bit exciting. So what will we do? We'll make it a competition. So you turn up at a particular venue, each poem gets each poet gets two or three minutes to perform a poem, and the audience judges. Um, and usually it's kind of three to five judges from the audience chosen at random. So, you know, they might throw five lollies into the audience or whatever, Um, and it's kind of like the old ice skating where you hold up a clipboard and there's a mark out of ten. So it's kind of like almost, you know, the Olympics of poetry, I suppose. Um, And this really took off kind of in the 80s uh, over in the States and I think probably took another 10, 15 years to make it to Australia or the UK. Um, And so, yeah, about, I guess, 15 years ago, um, this was a, an art form that was quite prominent in Australia and and as an emerging writer I thought, well, it's really hard to actually get a hearing from a publisher and get things published on the page. But if I turn up at this place at this time, 
I'm going to know that I have three minutes with an audience. And so that's kind of how it all really started for me. Oh, that's interesting. It makes me think of like uh, mic nights for comedies. You know, you get up and you've got a minute to practice material so you can build up to a fuller, I guess, show or yeah. special. But that's I'd, I'd never heard the term before, slam poetry. So sorry if that was yeah. a dumb question, but I thought, I'd like to be clear on my terms. Um, and so that that's fascinating. How does that then progress to specifically focusing on children? Because obviously... With Spark Hub, I'm I'm trying to build a, a hub of great content that is sort of helps parents, yeah. teachers, uh, with with um, helping spark interest in their kids in certain things. So, how did it get to a point where you were sort of focusing on uh, the the children side of things? Well, I think for me, um, you know, as I said, I'd written a book of short fiction, I'd written a memoir. Um, was with one of my kids in the library one day and, you know, in Australia there is a lack of diversity in children's books and trying to search for material that kind of shows a diverse household, I kind of just had that thought of, well, I'm already writing for adults, I have access to a publisher, why am I not making work like this? Um, and it's interesting you, you ask about kind of the link between that initial starting with slam slam poetry and ending up writing for, for children most recently, I realised recently that, you know, that is the work that is most read out loud, you know. We're all kind of doing slam poetry with our kids at night time, you know, before they go to bed or, you know, for, for some of us every two minutes when they bring a book, drag a book over. Um, and so this idea of, I guess, using the oral tradition or the spoken word to actually encourage um, engagement in literature is something that we're all kind of doing without even thinking about it. So all of the kids' books which I've published, uh, the picture books, they're all actually illustrated poems. So they do have a story, um, but they're all written, you know, if you kind of sucked them out of the book and stuck them on an A4 page, they'd, they'd read as a poem, they're rhyming books. That's interesting. I, I was... I was um thinking about something as you were talking, which is if I cast my mind forward to now as a sort of almost middle-aged, uh, you know, adult, and I cast my mind back to the skills I wish I had, so to speak, um, I know that writing is crucial and uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, to be a good writer means you can think. You know, if you're at a university level and you can write a great, great essay, that's wonderful. If you get beyond university and you can write in the boardroom, you can write for a creative agency, you can write. I mean, I've, I've been involved in a lot of businesses with a lot of creativity, but the good writers fuel everything. They fuel, they fuel the way you shoot an ad. They fuel the way you shoot a video. They fuel the way you concept something. And as you say, it starts with the words, and then it, boy, it, it, it then expands very quickly into all kinds of other things, music, business. You, you can think of many applications for how words well applied will pay dividends, you know, as I say, in any career, frankly. There's not one career I can think of where you wouldn't benefit from words. So I've painted a picture of things I wish I had, you know, as I've grown older, and I, I then cast my mind back to what my children are doing now. And just to give you one example, my youngest is very artistic, and he loves puns, and he loves jokes, and he loves wordplay. And so I try and, and, and encourage that. And interestingly, he's, he's now seven years old. Um, he reads the Mr. Men books, but what he likes is having the words next to an image. And so I've tried mm. to read chapter books and fiction books that my oldest kind of got into, maybe didn't. He likes more nonfiction, but the, 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 the concept of him having images and words together works really well for him. And he sits here and he prolifically draws images of stuff in his mind, and we're trying to get him into words as well. So I, that's a long roundabout way of saying it's very important, I think, for words and writing to be taught at a, at a at an early stage or at least the love of it because it then opens doorways into much bigger and broader things that can pay huge dividends in the future in, in adulthood that we may not ever see. So with that in mind, um, it's fascinating that you're in you, you're doing this. And, and am, I, am I right in saying you're doing it full-time? Like, is it your full-time occupation to, to write? Yes. That's yeah, great. it is. Yeah. So yeah, that that you know, that that kind of full-time writer occupation, it does involve a lot of um, I guess incidental add-ons like you know visiting schools and talking about the books and and things like that so when I say I'm a full-time writer I think often people imagine you know you're locked in your study for eight hours a day every day 
my actual writing practice, I'd say, is maybe 40% of the time. And the rest is really engaging with the work that I've put out and with the people that are reading it in some shape or form. And that's wonderful that you have that ratio of public appearance to grinding in the dark with a with a quill. Um, <laughs> but could you give me? Could you tell me a story of 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 a, of a moment that might have happened where you saw a child light up because of the type of work you do? And I know you maybe have several examples, but one that sticks in your mind in particular. Yeah, definitely. There's there's a book that I wrote. Uh, my first picture book is called The Patchwork Bike, and it's about a trio of kids, um, black kids. They live near this desert in a village on the African continent. Um, and it's really about this bike that they've got that they're absolutely in love with that's made of junk, you know, the, the handlebars made of branches and the seats made of a bucket. And the mother in this book, and this is a book that I didn't illustrate, it was uh, illustrated by a street artist named Van T. Rudd. And Van kind of um, drew this, the mother of this family, uh, the, the story was kind of taken from a short story of mine and made into a children's book. And he draw, drew her with a Muslim head covering and um, a hijab. And uh, reading this at story time and, you know, a kid kind of, you know, two or three coming up to the chair, you know, when they're all kind of sitting around your legs and saying, that's my mum. You know, my mum is in the book, Mark. And she just kept saying this over and over again. And I suppose the realisation that particularly in Australia, that was probably the first time that this child had seen someone who looked like her mum and was dressed like her mum depicted in, in a storybook. And, of course, she didn't realise why she kept saying this thing over and over again, but you could just see the shock on her face. So I think things like that, which don't even necessarily come down to in that text, you know, that same text could be taken and really applied to any family, but because the illustrations actually depicted this diverse family all of a sudden, you know, different kids were kind of coming up to this picture book. And I find that quite a lot. You know, it's this idea of, um, you know, creating, I call them either kind of windows or mirrors. You know, it's either a window into someone else's life or it's a mirror to kind of reflect that child's experience. And so I think the things that stand out for me, and particularly two of my adult books, which I never wrote imagining they would be for um, young people are actually now on the year 12 syllabus in my state. So they're studied for leaving year at high school. And that has been incredible as well, kind of going into schools, talking to teenagers about these texts um, and just kind of, I guess, seeing how young people are engaging with reading at this time. That's amazing. And congratulations that now even made it to syllabus status. You must be really proud of that. I mean, it's kind of weird, but... <laughs> But yeah, it's 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 great. It's amazing. I, I just two two quick reflections on what you just said about that story. It said um, there was a previous guest I spoke to uh, named Mallory Blackman and also Joseph Coelho, who I interviewed. And they they uh, this was through the Empathy Labs, and it was under the topic of empathy. And one of the things that came up was, as you say, identity. So how do you identify? And, and nowadays, it's there's identity pol politics, even if we take it to an extreme, but. At a young age, as you say, if you're exposed and empathized to other people's position, be it from a superficial point of view or from a, a religious point of view, you seem to do better in life because it's not a shock to you. It doesn't trigger any sort of threat level that you, you see someone who's different. And I've, I've been fascinated myself in this for a number of reasons. I grew up in a very diverse neighborhood when I was growing up. Everyone was a different shade. Everyone was a different religion. Every house had different food and different languages. And I thought that's just how the world was. And it wasn't until I moved, uh, well, I lived in Australia for a while, but I've been living in the UK for a while, and specifically the past few years in a very rural area where there isn't, frankly, a lot of diversity. Uh, and I don't see, you know, I don't get to eat jerk chicken as much as I'd like to. And mm -hmm. it, I'm, my, my kids are coming up in, in frankly, a, a very non-diverse neighborhood. But what I am noticing is all the, the videos they're watching, either be on YouTube or some of the shows we see on TV now, it's colorblind casting, which I think is phenomenal because they're being exposed. You know, in, in every story, there's always a hierarchy. And now that it's sort of a flat hierarchy, anyone of, of a different color or of wearing a hijab or whatever is, is positioned in the same way as 
what you might call historically a privileged or a white background, which I think is phenomenal. So even if we're not getting the diversity from the immediate surroundings, they're getting the diversity through all the different forms of media they're reading. And when we read stories to them, it's wonderful to see that the characters are all different. So that that that's, I think, a big plus in, in, in the space that you operate in. Um, but what I was going to say is, is the identity thing is is very interesting because if we go dark for just a minute in terms of something I heard recently, which is if you look at especially boys um, and women to a degree, they're constantly under different types of onslaughts. So one onslaught on the women's side could be uh, could be the use of Instagram filters, Tumblr, this constant bombardment of beauty that comes in a gambling machine that you hold in your hands doesn't seem to affect the boys as much right, based on the studies I've read, but the boys can easily get sucked into violent games um, and, and, and dark areas like that. So it seems to me more than ever with that amount of, shall we say, exposure uh, that can lead to very dark places as far, I'd go as far as saying losing your identity or becoming an incel and it can go to, you know, to extreme levels if you have access to weapons, which which sadly uh, happens a lot in the U.S., but backing into identity, it seems to be more crucial than ever. But the type of work that you do, allowing people to find an identity through storytelling, allowing people to find uh, a copy of them somewhere else, probably is pretty critical work in this day and age. And and so I wonder how how your work, whether it's written on on paper or in other words, how is it getting into a sort of more of a multimedia execution? Are you able to take your work and turn it into animations and other things like that is there scope for that feels to me like it's crucial we need to bake diversity into this type of stuff for the for the good of everyone so i'd love you to riff on that if you don't mind yeah i mean i think my work um i've been quite surprised when you know particularly in australia 20 or so years ago um the diversity of work that was being produced just wasn't there um, at the moment, my memoir, uh, which is titled The Hate Race, um, is in the process of being adapted for theatre in Melbourne, where I live. Um, and I'm also working on a screen adaptation of my short fiction collection, Foreign Soil. And so that has been quite surprising as well, the longevity of the work and the approaches by people kind of saying, look, we know it exists in this form, but have you thought about also, you know, giving it to this audience or kind of rejigging the format? Um, and, of course, the work changes so considerably when you do things like that to it. Um, so it's it will be really interesting to see how it's engaged with in those formats. Um, but, yeah, I think you're right, you know, this idea that, you know, there's often this concept that work that contains diversity is for diverse audiences. Uh, but, you know, particularly with you know, things like COVID-19, where you actually for years we haven't been able to travel properly or, you know, people losing jobs and not actually being able to travel, books and increasingly, you know, television shows, computer games, whatever kids are gravitating towards, that's the way they're actually finding out about the world. So if those things, you know, whoever the child is, if those things don't reflect the real world, then it's disadvantaging the child, whoever they are. So it's not just, you know, kind of the matter of um, wanting to see oneself in the work. It's, well, you know, do we really want to be disadvantaging our children by showing them a world that is completely unrealistic um, and, and that's essentially, you know, they're not going to be able to function once they get in the real world. Um, so, yeah, it's been interesting to see, I think, the face of literature. There's still a long way to go, but see it just start to change that little bit. I mean, what you said is your work has application in, in, in a wider array of things other than just writing. And so if 40% is writing and 60% is touring or, or doing face-to-face, -face, that's wonderful. It, it feels to me now there's a huge opportunity, Maxine, for you to even take that foundation level of work and maximize it in different channels. And as you say, it, it seemed to be, if we talk COVID for just a minute, when we were all cooped up, where did we turn? And, and as you know, at a macro level, so much has changed in terms of consumption of media, turning to different sources, podcasting. Um, there just seems to be this boom of people that in the, in the absence of seeing other humans or being constrained and, and restricted from being seeing other human beings will immediately still seek a connection. And it sounds like your work is well positioned, 
you know, to be there if it can get on the right channels and into wider groups. So it's phenomenal that it's now a theater show in Melbourne. I wish I could go see it, but I can't travel <laughs> that far. It's phenomenal that you're on the syllabus, but it, it must give you hope that the work has wider application. And, and as you say, um, it feels to me the challenge that lies ahead of you is that it's, it's the windows now. As you say, there's the window in the mirror, but it's, it's, there's now more than ever, more windows than ever. And the downside of that is there's a lot of competition. But it feels to me like, you know, it, it, in the past seven years, you've come this far, you've focused on children, you've got to this, this point where you're seeing not only these great stories of pe- kids identifying through the books and having a place to go, but now the proliferation through COVID, the behavior change fundamentally of consumption, seems to, it seems that your work has a wider application. And so I just, casting your mind forward, um, I know you're doing 4060 now in terms of your full-time vacation but do you think that's going to change is it going to become heavier on the personal front do you think there's are you able to fund and pursue some of these extensions of your work into different mediums i'd love to hear what you think the next seven years is going to look like given what's happened over the past two who knows i'm always surprised at where things end up you know i mean i think the thing with um adaptations of work in any form is it needs just such a um a wide array of things to fall in place for it ever to happen. So you're kind of doing a lot of them on a wing and a prayer that you're going to get the next trench of funding for a development or the next, you know, investment to do X, Y, Z. Um, But, you know, I mean, an interesting thing for me, um, you know, during kind of that lockdown COVID uh, era, you know, 2020 was when, yeah, after the death of George Floyd, when Black Lives Matter protests were kind of unfolding across the world, um, in almost every country we saw books by black writers go back to the top of bestseller lists. You know, people were reading, um, you know, memoirs and reading books on race and reading books on the history of African America and, and things like that. And so it was this real kind of moment of, Some of these books were quite widely known and some it was kind of just, well, we can't go out and talk about these things. We're all locked in our houses. We want to actually understand what's happening. Where are we going to turn? We're going to turn to the literature that's actually been sitting there for years, in some cases for decades or for for half a century if you're talking about, you know, James Baldwin or someone like that. Um, And that was really interesting for me to kind of suddenly have people texting me saying, oh, I read your memoir, I read this, and thinking, well, actually, that's it's been around for seven or eight years now. <laughs> you know? um, and so, yeah, that I think was a real reminder to me, not so much that it's not so much always about looking forward to the next project. You know, sometimes it's actually about the legacy of what you've created and just trusting that it's there and that whenever the time arises, because it's being created, it's kind of sitting there waiting for the right person. Well, it sounds like um, my question was, what does the next few years look like? But it sounds like you've, you've built a solid foundation and now it's a question of just reacting to, to uh, you know, the changes. And none of us could have predicted COVID, lockdown, yeah. homeschooling, any of that stuff. And, and as you say, there was this sudden demand. Interesting, though, mm-hmm. that a lot of people went to the legacy material. I mean, I always think of The Color Purple because we, we read that in high school. We saw the film. We read a lot of Black mm. History Month when I was growing up because, like I said, half my class was was ended from, from Africa or Caribbean anyway, and then we had a whole mix of other people. So for us, it was just normal. Everyone was different. But I've never known, mm. like, what's it like to grow up where you don't get exposed to any of that in your classroom? Then you have to take the next step, which is to grab the literature, to grab the books, to, as you say, read more. Mm. But I, I didn't know of that stat. That's interesting that suddenly there was a, there was a huge demand for this type of stuff. It seems to me based on what you're saying and what you're observing and that there's almost hope that, that people are still fundamentally curious. They're still fundamentally empathetic and they're still fundamentally trying, you know, in the absence of conversations, what I like to call the fireside chats, which I think got stolen from us. Uh, and I, and I don't say that lightly. It was stolen. Those years were stolen for those of us that had kids of a certain age. We did lose key playing years. We did lose key learning years. And, and the best we could do was, was, you know, trying to find stuff online, frankly, to, to watch. But um, it, it feels to me now there's a almost a wider opportunity if, if the, the content you created in the past has stuck and you can see it's making a difference and it has applications and your windows and mirrors are working, 
it feels to me like there's a lot of upside for you ahead that, that it's a case of when the opportunities arise you can sort of scale as it were and take this take this wonderful writing it, it makes me think just as a, as a sidebar um i used to know a lot of people who wrote um film scripts in um hollywood and uh it amazes me whenever a film comes out, I'll even use the example of Black Panther, which was a, I think a major moment in cinema, cinema, cinemagraphic endeavor. Um, any script sometimes sits around for 10 years because of the yeah. legal process and the, and the way that studios work and whatever. And, and the, the lesson I take from that is something you create now is not wasted. Um, and it's, you've been at it for seven years. It feels to me like in a couple of years, uh, suddenly you could be sitting on gold dust because the, the, you know you can adapt your work. And so I guess it's a case for you of being consistent. But I would love to, to sort of um, ask, I guess, one final question to you, which is what did COVID do to you personally? And I mean, what I mean by that is I know Australia had some very severe restrictions. Uh, UK was kind of half-half. Well, it was a big mess for everyone, let's face it. But in Australia in particular... I'd love you to tell me what what COVID taught you, if anything, how it changed the 60-40 ratio, because you didn't get to go out as much as you would have wanted to. Schools were shut, people were cooped up. Talk me through what COVID did for your work in terms of you personally and in terms of, of, of what you were trying to do professionally. Yeah, for my work, it it definitely cleared that kind of public aspect, which I actually don't think was terrible. You know, I had a lot of school visits booked in, which I do love to do. But, you know, when you're visiting for a book that's been on the syllabus for many years, you know, you kind of have, you do have to kind of try and reinvigorate yourself to give that excitement to the kids that you had, you know, years ago. Um, but because, you know, I'm in Melbourne, so we had one of, one of, I think at the time, the longest lockdowns in the world. It was just months and months and months in and out of lockdown you know, those awful exercise restrictions where you could only go out for an hour a day and all those kinds of things. And so I ended up actually making a kid's book because I thought, what can I do with, you know, my kids home doing homeschool um, at the kitchen table or whatever? And that thing was a, a kid's picture book. So I made a picture book titled When We Say Black Lives Matter. And that was really responding to the moment, I suppose, of that galvanisation of Black Lives Matter um, movement around the world and looking at um, what can I create for younger kids who are locked in this 24-hour news cycle seeing snippets of these protests and these speeches and thinking what on earth is happening. Yeah, so the, that 24-hour news cycle that um, we were all locked in and because we were all at home with our TVs on and kids were watching these kind of protests march and the anger and things like that and thinking, well, how do I create something that actually allows us to open up this conversation to kids and let them ask what they want to ask about this movement um, and also, you know, just open up the dialogue. And so this became really this hothouse picture book project. Um, I made the picture book text and images probably in about three and a half months, which is, is very, very quick. But because all of a sudden everything else was off my plate, um, it was this kind of just really rapid, rapid creation, rapid publication, um, and then, yeah, kind of getting it out into the UK and US and Australia um, for readers. And so I guess it fundamentally changed the way I was working at the time. It allowed me to focus on one particular project. Yeah, any school visits or talks I did um, then became online, which is a very different experience, as everyone would know from all of our Zoom time, than actually being in the classroom with kids. For us, it was it was a loss in terms of, you know, some crucial learning years were, were lost. But it sounded like you, you were able to be productive and perhaps, as you say, one of the worst lockdown cities <laughs> in the world. Um, yeah. So I'm glad you were able to do that. And I do hope long term that whatever you baked in those years can can be useful in the years to come. I do see that, you know, we need reconciliation and truth as, as happened in South Africa in many ways in terms of coming to the truth of what what did happen, how did it happen, why did it happen, how can we prevent it from happening again. But your work sounds, you know, phenomenal. And I'm very glad that you're able to do it full time. I've, I've spoken to, um, in fact, another Australian, she's Kiwi, but lives in Australia. 
another author named uh, Avril and uh, Avril McDonald, and and she uh, created the Phil Brave series. And so her journey is not too dissimilar from yours in terms of uh, you know quite a lengthy amount of time to get to a good point. But but she wasn't able to do it full time, uh, just like I can't do Spark Hub full time at the moment. And so you chip away at it, but eventually it turns into great stuff. And I do find like Avril and like you, that when you can focus your attention on it full time, the results are phenomenal. Um, and it sounds like you're on a great, you know, on a great journey and it's wonderful to hear. So I um, really appreciate you joining me today. And, and it's been very insightful. I think my, my biggest takeaway from this whole discussion is, is the power of writing and the power of focus and the, and what it can lead to um, in any discipline. I'm glad that it's led to, you know, artistic endeavors for yourself, but it, it sounds like what you do has application, frankly, in almost any way. And we're going to continue to try and teach our kids, you know, wordplay and words uh, as much as we can because it pays dividends down the road. Lovely to hear that you're fostering a love of words in your kids. You know, I think that's if one if there's one last comment I can make, it's that I think you know, the, the greatest thing that I could give is not really my work, but hopefully creating more writers, <laughs> you know, that that legacy of, of interesting people in the written word enough for them to go out and fall in love with it as well. It all starts with a story, no matter who you are, right? And if, as you say, if the story can have a window and a mirror, then, mm. then it has a huge value, I think, in, in, in any situation, COVID or otherwise. Um, so Maxine, thanks again for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me, Alan. Thanks for listening to this episode of our podcast. Uh, if you like what you hear, you can dive into a lot more on thesparkhub.com.